All right. So um, one of the things I wanted to do here, a lot of times when I see people present at conferences, um, the topics that they present on end up being sort of fairly non-controversial um, things on which there's like sort of wide agreement and consensus. Um, and so I wanted to change it up a little bit and try and think of something that I could make a case for that I think almost everyone will universally disagree with. Um, <clears throat> and so um, uh, one of the sort of most common tropes about uh, startup startups and how to do them well is that it's really important to focus. Um, you should narrow the scope of what you're doing as much as possible. You start really small, you kind of grow and expand from there. <clears throat> um, you can see this sort of everywhere very broadly um, across a lot of different startup advice, including, um, you know, from some of my, you know, favorite Silicon Valley characters, um, uh, in this case, you know, Bill Gurley and uh, David, I was only CEO of that company very briefly, Sachs, um, who both also agree that like focusing very narrowly is extremely important. Um, but I think it's advice that is largely wrong and has held back um, the industry and has held back a lot of sort of really important companies that could have been created, but have not been. Um, and so what, what's wrong with this? Um, I think one problem is that it sort of narrows the types of problems that you, you work on. Um, so, uh, you know, when you think about the problems that your clients have, they often span a lot of different uh, business systems or point solutions. Um, in fact, I think some of the biggest problems and the hairiest problems, and therefore the problems that potentially could give rise to the most valuable companies uh, tend to be things that span a lot of different point solution products within a business. Um, and therefore, like only building sort of one point solution product can't really address them. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is that this idea of focus, I think it was actually pretty decent advice maybe like a decade ago. Um, because a decade ago um, in sort of B2B SaaS companies, you could really build like any business tool and build it as sort of a SaaS subscription product on the web. And you were pretty much guaranteed to hit what would eventually become a, a really successful company if you did it well. But the problem is now, you know, it's 2021 and there are actually like a lot of different companies operating in all of these different sort of narrow point solution verticals. And so I think there is actually now a lot more opportunity um, if you can go bigger and sort of combine a bunch of these different point solutions into one product. And the third thing is that um, a lot of people will say, look, you start with one thing, then you expand to others. And, um, you know, I think that that tends not to happen. Um, companies that focus early on tend to continue to focus. I think that often a company's ambition is circumscribed on day one when it's founded. And it's really hard to move beyond that. Um, whatever you decide to do initially, the problems that you have to address are always so deep. You keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And companies that start out and think, well, we're going to do first A and then B really tend to never get to B. Um, they tend to sort of stick with A for a very long time. Um, and so what's the alternative to this? Um, you know, I think the alternative um, is something that I call the compound startup. Um, which is a startup <clears throat> that instead of just doing one very narrow thing, tries to address a whole set of different point solution systems, uh, tries to build a whole set of different point solution systems um, in one sort of coherent product um, and tackle several different related point solutions at once to solve a much larger problem for businesses. Um, and, uh, so why would you do this? Um, because there are a lot of reasons why it's hard. Um, um, the first thing is, is this idea um, that these sort of compound startup opportunities are relatively unexplored because everyone has been focusing for so long. Um, <clears throat> I think what it, what it leads to is that there are, you know, doing one thing there might be, there's a ton of competition there, but if you take on a series of different related, closely related products and do them all at once, 
there are these islands of undiscovered product market fit that are sort of just beyond the horizon line um, that no one has sort of sailed out to because of all of this advice um, that you should narrow your ambition and narrow your focus to like just one very specific thing, which often sort of isn't enough to kind of get you from point A to point B. Um, the second thing is there are a whole set of just product advantages that come from having a multi-product company. Um, one is, the first is just like integration. Um, the types and the depth of integration that you can have <clears throat> when you're building a set of like related products together in-house is so much more powerful um, than what you can do through a set of APIs with other vendors. Um, I think Keith Raboy calls this like the advantage of closed systems. Um, there are a set of often like shared components. You can identify certain bits of functionality or certain parts of the product that end up being reused um, across a number of different products that you're building. And you can build those once um, and have some advantages on like R&D efficiency, but more importantly, you can afford to go much deeper and invest um, uh, much more deeply on those sort of critical pieces that are shared across these different products than you can if you're building just like one sort of point solution system. And we'll talk about some examples of that in a second. Um, for your clients, it's so much easier. There are common UX patterns. They get to, they learn how to use your product and they've already learned how to use four different products. They don't have to like do things in four different ways across four completely you know, separate products. Um, and the last one, and this is really important, is there's this incredible contracting and pricing advantage <clears throat> where um, um, a lot of times, um, you know, the, a, a bundled contract or a bundled system, you can optimize your price for the value of the bundle um, rather than the sort of value of any specific point solution. So you can take a bunch of things that cost, you know, $10 each, um, you know, say five different things that cost 10 bucks, you can charge $20 for the finished product and undercut each of those point solution competitors on pricing for the individual products. So you make more money, your customers save money. Um, I think uh, uh, Shisha, I think is, is presenting elsewhere at this conference on Coda. Um, this is something that really came from him. He has a great blog post on sort of bundling and pricing and bundling. Um, that's really focused around cable bundles, but I think a lot of it applies to subscription software as well. Um, and the last thing is, you know, <clears throat> the companies that you tend to build tend to be like bigger and more ambitious. Um, you're, you're solving like the whole problem as opposed to just building a tool. Um, it's ideal for sort of process and coordination problems across a company that tend to stretch across different business systems. Um, it is for sure hard. Um, there's no hiding that. Um, there's something very challenging about trying to build multiple things at once. And, and some of the folks that talk about focused startups um, sort of go to this point. They say, well, look, you're better off doing one thing well than doing many things poorly. And uh, I agree with that. I think that's right. Um, I think uh, a compound startup uh, cannot be a crappy startup. Like you still need to be good at all these different things. Um, but there are some advantages that you have um, when you're building in a compound way. And one of them is, is really integration, that um, the best compound startups tend to be ones where the product is the integration, where you can build a product that's 10 times better uh, precisely because of how deeply it's integrated or these different products are integrated with each other. And so areas where integration matters <clears throat> tend to lend themselves to this sort of compound approach. Um, and you also, you get to sort of reuse functionality. So there are these R&D efficiencies that you get by being able to identify things that sort of every one of the products you're building needs that you can build once, you can build much better, you can you know, avoid repeating yourself as an engineer um, and that can make sort of the product better. Um, <clears throat> so some examples of this, um, I wanted to start with a hypothetical example. Um, actually someone recently, a friend reached out to me who's thinking of starting another company. And he was asking me for, um, you know, just ideas, um, you know, and, and I was sort of working on this presentation at the time. And I sort of said, you know, um, you know, there are these areas where maybe these sort of compound startup approaches might work. And um, the one that we discussed, which he, I think he ultimately sort of said like, oh, that sounds too hard, which I, I agree with. It would be incredibly hard to take on. 
um, is uh, taking, you know, there's a bunch of these tools that we now use, and I think a lot of different companies use, um, <clears throat> sort of pre-demo in, in sales. Um, so you have like tools like Outreach for prospecting, Calendly, Chili Piper for scheduling, and Lean Data for sort of like lead routing, Gong for call recording. And, you know, at Rippling, we collectively pay about $300 per employee per month for all of those tools. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, and uh, you can imagine a world where someone came along and built a new company that sort of encompassed like all five of these things. Um, and if you did that, <clears throat> you'd have a couple of like really distinct advantages. Um, one of them would be on the pricing side. Um, why sort of these systems are often so expensive is because they need to um, they need to price at a level where they can afford to compete from a sales and marketing perspective. It's really a lot about that sort of go to market motion. Um, you need to charge enough to make it make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze <clears throat> when you win a customer. Um, and so, but you could you could come up with something where you would do all five of these things. You charge a hundred dollars per employee per month instead of 300, which is what these things cost collectively, we would save a bunch of money, you would make more. Um, and you know, the sort of marketers and the sort of marketing and sales operations people that are running these systems would have single integrated systems to manage. You could start to invest a lot more deeply in some functionality <clears throat> that ends up being really, really critical to the sort of overall system that has is given sort of shorter shrift in these systems individually, things like business intelligence and reporting, multi-touch attribution. Uh, a lot of compound startups end up finding places where they can have a single underlying data model. In this case, with this hypothetical company, it would be the data model around prospects. Um, and uh, and, and uh, you could potentially take on all these companies and like, look, you know, building just you know, outreach is not enough. Um, you're going to get destroyed by outreach. Building just Gong, same thing. Um, but if you do all of these together, suddenly it's really hard. Um, but you now are building something that I think is foundationally and fundamentally better than all of the point solutions combined. Um, and so if you can do it, you could win and you could win big um, because it's hard to imagine you know, something like um, uh, you know, something like Calendly, like say taking on Salesforce, although I know Tope is an incredible founder and, and I know is hugely ambitious. Um, so may, maybe I'm wrong about that, but, um, um, but you can imagine that someone who sort of rolled together all these different products in one, that's suddenly a, a, a sort of that product has a scope and a surface area that you could imagine it starting to attack a business like Salesforce in a more head-on fashion. And so the outcome is potentially much larger. On the other hand, <clears throat> um, if you take an example of like a focus startup like Slack, um, and first of all, you know, um, Slack and, you know, everyone's there, they built a company that's so much more successful than anything that I've ever built. Um, and I have nothing but respect for what an incredible business and a product they built. Um, but you can sort of see this dynamic evolving where I think like Microsoft is kind of the ultimate compound company where they're selling multiple different products. Um, there's this deep integration that they have with Active Directory that everything sort of ties back to Active Directory. For IT teams at big companies, you know, anything that they buy from Microsoft is like, eh, they already, you know, it's, it's with the same contract, the same vendor, the same basic, you know, sort of deployment that they have everywhere else. It's a lot easier. And of course, like, because Microsoft is amortizing their sales and marketing costs across this much broader product suite, um, you know, they can start to sort of undercut <clears throat> a company like Slack on price for this one specific product, even though they're maximizing the price of the Microsoft bundle as a whole. Um, and then lastly, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Rippling, but I think Rippling, my own company is like a really great example, I think, of a compound company. Um, and the sort of central insight behind Rippling is that employee data is a lot more distributed across a company than most people realize. And that sort of a lot of the existing products in the market <clears throat> mistakenly think of employee data as an HR department thing that is, that is a concern for HR business systems. And we actually think that almost every business system that companies use 
is full of information about employees. And therefore, you want this sort of employee system that can integrate broadly across not just like HR systems, but IT systems, finance systems, sort of a bunch of different back office functions. Um, and that when you do that, there's a tremendous amount of stuff that's simplified um, for our clients because everything sort of like ties together to this one underlying employee record. Um, <clears throat> so compound startups, th there, there's a pattern, I think, to making them successful, a playbook. Um, and the playbook, in my view, uh, first, it starts with integration. Um, like you have, you have to have a set of products where integration really matters. Um, if the integration doesn't matter, then there's no product value to you or to your clients of doing these things together. And all you have is like the difficulty and the challenge of doing multiple things in parallel well. Um, <clears throat> and so you want to you wanna make sure that there's some value to the integration and you want to make that integration, the centerpiece of your product. Um, the second sort of common theme is I think you wanna, you wanna find ways to sort of maximize the price of your bundle while undercutting the prices of individual SKUs. Um, <clears throat> and that allows you, it gives you a structural advantage uh, against point solution competitors um, because you can do that. Um, your clients save money, you make more money, um, you can afford to sort of outgun them on the sales and marketing and the R&D side of things. Um, and then also you need like, <clears throat> I think often a, a, different, um, a different company structure because um, you need to orient your entire organization around parallel execution. Um, so at Rippling, one of the things we do is we have an engine, about half the company is in engineering. Uh, first of all, it's a much higher percentage than most other SaaS businesses. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and our engineering team, you know, is about sort of 150 uh, engineers and growing, um, but it's not a monolithic team. Um, there's really sort of this like loose federation of much more individually focused teams where there's a team that builds payroll, there's a team that builds device management, <clears throat> there's a P team that builds, you know, sort of insurance and benefits administration. And each of those teams individually have a tremendous amount of focus. Um, it also means you need to hire people differently. So um, you need people who can run those almost like business units um, that are both sort of engineering teams, but also, you know, they're cross-functional. They include customer support, um, uh, you know, product management, design, sort of a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so one of the things like at Rippling, we end up hiring a tremendous number of people that have had this experience of like founding a company before. I think we have something like 35 or 40 former founders um, at Ripley, it's more than 10% of our employee base um, because we need people who can sort of run these individual products. Um, <clears throat> and so then lastly, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about doing this, um, just to kind of like put these two different approaches side by side, um, you know, focused companies are building one product versus compound startups are building multiple products in parallel. Um, a focused company is, is usually building a tool um, and a compound startup is solving this larger, usually a larger coordination problem across a lot of different business systems. Um, the focus startup has to maximize their revenue from one single SKU and a sort of multi-product company, a compound startup can maximize revenue across a bundle, can optimize for the bundled price <clears throat> and therefore deliver cost savings to clients on the individual products. Um, and focus startups in aggregate add to a client's systems complexity. Um, if you have um, a lot of different point solutions, eventually it becomes a real headache for you to manage. While as compound startups reduce complexity by consolidating a lot of these systems into one. Um, so I'll stop there um, and uh, bring in bring in Josh. Awesome. Thanks so much, Parker. I just personally just want to thank you that, you know, I've seen so many and moderated so many sessions at conferences over the years. And oftentimes the like, speakers come in essentially unprepared. And the fact that you like built this whole presentation for Startup Grind and the audience here, I think just shows like your, the depth of your care for other founders and how much you want to contribute to the system and the ecosystem in general. So I just want to start off by thanking you for that and actually making something that was super compelling to watch for the last 20 minutes. Um, 
So thank, thank you. you for that. But I, I want to jump in though and ask a few times about your own experiences here. So first off, I'd love to hear like when you were starting Rippling, what was the kind of pushback when you were looking to build a compound <clears throat> startup? And like, how did you counter that? Or, you know, how did you convince other people that like, yes, I get that everyone says I should make a focused startup. How do you convince those people that like, no, 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 in this time I get that it's going to be harder, but why should you bet on me to be able to do that? Um, I, I think it's hard because you're going against this conventional wisdom. Um, so um, part of why I, I wanted to kind of give this talk is I, th I, want, I want this to become a more acceptable approach for other people. Um, and when you're, when you're fundraising, when you're sort of talking to others, um, hopefully there's a word for it and there's a rationale for going about it in this way. <clears throat> um, I think that um, there was always for us, you know, there was this kind of balancing act um, when we were selling Rippling, selling it to prospective employees, to investors, to um, sort of other constituencies between uh, sort of the, the clear advantages that we could articulate about why, why things were better if you could actually do all of these different systems in one, um, why that was a much better product experience for clients versus the sort of countervailing force of like, oh my gosh, like you've got multiple products, which means you have multiple buyers, which means, um, you know, and sort of divided focus and, and all that kind of stuff. And what we kept coming back to is like, yeah, yeah, yeah all of that, all of those things are challenges. Um, but, but it means that the only challenge we have is execution, because if we can build this and build it well, it's clearly better. Um, and, and that was sort of the bet that people were willing to place was that if we could do it, um, uh, we would win and we would win really big. Um, awesome. So I'd love to uh, ask one, another question about this. First of all, if you guys want to ask your own questions, we'd love to hear them. If you go into the little Q&A tab in the chat interface for Startup Grind, you can submit some questions and we'll be pulling them from there. And if you're interested in joining us for more questions later, we're going to be doing an after party on Clubhouse at 5.30 p.m. And I just put the link in the chat there. Um, that's 5.30 Pacific. But Parker, I wanted to ask, when has this failed for you? Like, have you had moments where like trying to do too much has not worked out? And you know, uh, what did you learn from those experiences that maybe helped inform this strategy? <clears throat> Yeah, I think one of the things I, I've seen historically is that um, to, to make this work, uh, the sort of the business organization piece that I talked about is really critical. Like you have to, you have to sort of create uh, new teams that are um, relatively, I mean, like maybe isolated is the wrong word, but you want, um, you can't have a bunch of people working on a product um, sort of just thrown into a much larger organization, you need to create a small focused cross-functional team. And so, you know, recently we launched, um, you know, a time and attendance product at Rippling and um, we hired someone, a, a former startup, startup founder to kind of run it. Um, he built an early team of folks to work on it. Um, you know, uh, the team is still small, but uh, they're going to start over time you know, they have, a, you know, designers, though I'm sure have product managers, people and customer support that are focused on just that product. And sort of all of that is kind of carved out from the rest of the organization um, to create sort of uh, this situation where, where that team, they have like full context over this new product. Um, and they can have a lot of focus, even if the company as a whole is sort of oriented towards like, you know, making progress on multiple fronts in parallel. So you mentioned like working with essentially founders and when I've interviewed you in the past, you made a great comment about that. Like you love hiring former founders uh, because you can help have them run these individual units. Are there any other challenges with like working with former founders? Do you have to manage egos or do you have to sort of like make sure that they always feel like they have enough, like, like uh, you know, a power or influence in the organization? How do you make it so you can like contain a bunch of like, you know, big executive type people within an organization? I, I mean, I like, I love working with people who have started companies. I think it's one of the most fun things about Rippling in particular <clears throat> is that, that there are so many people with, with that experience. And I think it really shapes the kind of culture of the place. Um, um, so I really love it. Um, I have not found 
the startup founders that we've hired to be sort of super high ego or, or anything like that. I think if anything, starting a company sort of can really beat that out of you. Um, um, it's rarely like people might be high ego going into starting a startup, but usually coming out the other side, uh, you're sort of pretty beaten up by it. Um, I've certainly found it to be the case myself. So you talked a little bit about the, the benefits of being sort of a holistic system of, of point solutions rather than being just one. Uh, but obvi obviously, there's always those trade-offs in play where you, you might not be able to be the best in class, deepest solution for something if your focus isn't just on doing that, but being the like better holistic solution that integrates with everything else. You know, is it okay to not be best in class for one of your little point solutions? And how do you sort of grapple with that? Because I know everyone always wants to be building the best thing and going as deep as possible when in reality, like you said, it's like the bundle that maybe matters more than the depth of any given product. Yeah. See, I think that that, um, that is the traditional knock on this, but I think it misunderstands what makes a product the best product in a lot of these cases. Um, and I think in a lot of these cases, you build the best product by building it as sort of one piece of this larger constellation of tools. Um, <clears throat> because you get these benefits from integration, um, these benefits from sort of a common UX and, and sort of tooling across these different products. And like those things, uh, those things in the aggregate, sort of that's what makes this the best product. You sort of end up reimagining these product categories as sort of features in this sort of larger um, kind of system. Um, and that larger system can solve uh, client needs and problems in a much better way than a, a set of collected tools, um, even tools that are integrated with one another. Because the problem is, is whenever, um, you know, like, look, Rippling integrates with a ton of third-party systems, but you're always, when you're integrating via third-party APIs, you're always integrating via these sort of narrow tethers that connect these otherwise independent and separate systems. Um, <clears throat> and you can never quite get to the depth of integration um, that you can when you're building internally. Um, and so the argument here is not that building a compound startup, you do that at the expense of product quality. The argument is that there are a lot of cases out there where the compound startup is the best product. Got it. So uh, when you think about building on, to, on top of your existing product and sort of expanding your product line to become even more of a compound startup, how do you suggest entrepreneurs think about what next thing to build on? You, do you, <clears throat> are you focusing on like doing lots of customer interviews? Are you thinking about what would, you know, what would your em employees or what would you want to use? Are you thinking about like what the com competitive landscape? Like where is there a gap where we could maybe do something better than somebody else? Like where does the start of your ideation for the next element of your compound startup come from? It starts with a couple things. And, and the first and most important thing is really a conviction that the new product that we're building, that integration really matters. Um, and for us, you know, for Rippling, that means, you know, integration with the employee record matters a lot. Um, that simply by building this in a way that, you know, the new system that we're building understands all the information about your employees. It, under, it understands their departments and who their manager is and who their sort of HR business partner is and you know other information like the teams that they're on, their level, their, you know, maybe even their salary and their work location, that those, those things are going to unlock product capabilities in this sort of new segment or tool that are not available to you with standalone, even standalone and integrated systems today. And the second piece is that um, a lot of a lot of compound startups, I think one of the big advantages they have is building out this sort of set of sort of business software middleware, things like uh, reporting capabilities, uh, workflow tools, um, alerts, um, and that uh, and that you can go a lot deeper on those capabilities when you're building them for multiple different products. And so you have to believe that sort of wherever, wherever that bet is that you're placing, um, that that is going to matter um, for, um, 
you know, these for the new point solution that you're rolling out as well, that the ability to sort of build on top of that is important. So it sounds like you know, looking at where do you have natural advantages because of the, the integrations where like the things that you've already built are going to make this new product stronger and maybe stronger than somebody else's siloed point solution. That's right. Okay, so I wanted to ask a little bit about some of the questions that we have from the chat. If you guys are interested in asking questions, please jump into the Q&A uh, tab on the Startup Grind chat. And if you wanna join us later, we're gonna be talking more with Parker at 5.30 p.m. Pacific on Clubhouse. The link is also in the chat. But uh, one of the questions we had was, you know, my uh, Lazaro asked that, you know, my, one of my partners wants to start a focused startup and I wanna start a compound startup. How do you resolve those kind of tensions between co-founders or think about moving forward? Because I think oftentimes people think that there's, you. You either take one person's side, the other person's side, or some compromise. And I often like to think that there's usually a, a hidden fourth option, which is to just start something totally different. To that you know, if you haven't found consensus between us, rather than making one person unhappy or both people unhappy with a compromise, thinking about why don't we go back to the drawing board and find something everybody loves that we can promote together. But we'd love to hear your opinion on how do you resolve some of those founder conflicts. <laughs> Man, I don't think you do. I think um, I think you give up and do something else. Um, I mean, my <laughs> my first startup, um, you know, was um, I started a company in 2006 for all the wrong reasons. I started it with my roommate from college, and we decided first that we wanted to start a company together, and then we sort of sat about trying to figure out like, well, what were we going to do? Um, um, and it was just kind of like, it led to sort of six or seven years of slow grinding failure. Um, uh, and um, I don't recommend that anyone takes that approach. I think, you know, startups really need to start with a really pressing problem or, or sort of customer need. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm talking sort of B2B startups because I know nothing about <clears throat> um, you crazy consumer people, um, but um, <laughs> you know, you need to start with a problem and then sort of think about what's the right solution for that problem um, rather than the sort of des your desire to do a startup and then start sort of casting about for, for startup ideas. Like it usually, usually doesn't work out very well. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, and so that means that like, if you're starting with that problem, you want to be working with people who also have conviction about that specific problem. Um, within that, I, I tend to think that, um, the more ambitious versions of uh, startup ideas tend to be the ones that are going to work. Um, um, there are a lot of things that make sort of more ambitious startup ideas harder to execute on, um, but there are a lot of things that make them easier. Um, it often reduces the set of problems that you, <clears throat> that you have to overcome to execution. Um, it removes like, you know, uh, sort of um, market risk. It removes, it can help with recruiting. Um, it helps you tell a bigger story, paint a bigger vision. Um, all of those things are things that help you. Um, um, <clears throat> and so you think about, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of times with really good compound startups, um, the best question you're going to get from other people is, is going to be some version of like, why has no one else done this before? Like when you take sort of that, that sort of hypothetical company that I talked about around, um, around sort of this like sort of marketing tech compound startup, um, one question that, so, that, you know, people are likely to ask about is like, well, why hasn't anyone done, like, why don't they sort of like roll all these things together? And I think the answer is often that um, it's really freaking hard. Um, to do. And all of the conventional wisdom around this has been that it's too hard and you shouldn't go there. And that's why sort of like, I mean, you know, that's why kind of no one has sort of like reached that milestone yet. Um, I don't have an answer on the hard thing. Um, that's why they call it startup grind. Um, it's freaking hard. Um, <clears throat> but it does mean that if you can find a way, um, a lot of other problems take care of themselves for you. 
Awesome. So to recap some of the uh, top points, I think they were really smart from, from Parker's talk. It's just the idea of like that the deepest business problems often span multiple point solutions rather than a single point solution. And that, you know, focus has been this uh, good advice a decade ago, but maybe not now when the the field has been picked over and then, you know, it's tough to focus early and then expand. And so your, your ambition is often uh, circumscribed from the start. And that, you know, the alternative to the focus startup is compound startup idea often unlocks these undiscovered product market fit areas, places where people haven't built something. And that's often what you're really trying to find is like you, instead of having to grind through all the competition of a direct competitor, being able to find a whole place that, where something hasn't been built yet. Uh, and that you can often undercut by building multiple products and selling them for a one lower price point than uh, a point solution that might be cheaper than your bundle, but not cheaper than everything in your bundle combined. Um, and I, I really love the idea that, you know, you're, that there's a, a lot of this sort of, uh, need for a product integration uh, rather than a point solution. That so many of the biggest problems that we face aren't something where it's like, I just need one little tool. It's like, I need everything to work together. And it's that coordination that is really difficult and it actually creates this incredible moat because it's more difficult than everything else. And while this might be kind of a startup you know, 201, not like the entry level startup you want to build if you're a first timer, if you have the kind of credibility to be able to raise more funding or the expertise to build the space. And especially if you're starting with a very urgent problem rather than just wanting to start a company, you can have incredible su success with this compound startup idea. And so with that, I want to ask for one final thing. Do you have any other common like contrarian startup advice that goes against the, the grain of what everyone else recommends beyond this like focused startup versus compound startup idea? Um, man, with, with two minutes left, um, uh, first of all, I thought that was a great summary. I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, I have probably a lot of, a lot of sort of contrarian views about, uh, the types of investors that you want. Um, I think it's, uh, I think, you know, um, one thing that people will say is they'll say, you really want investors that, that care very deeply about your company. Um, I think that's like, can be actually a very dangerous dynamic, um, um, you know, investors that care, um, they, they tend to sort of get involved. Um, and no matter how smart they are or, or how much experience they have, investors that start getting too deeply involved, um, their opinions are often um, not, not very useful because they don't have enough context about the day-to-day -day operation of the business. And so investors that, you know, f feel a lot of need to, to add value and that, are sort of, you know, trying to involve themselves in the company are, you know, usually are going to destroy value in your startup. Any other major pieces of advice, especially like when you're thinking about like trying to find the, the right idea to start with or team management or anything else like that before we go? <clears throat> um, man, I think that's, that's probably it off the top of my head, but we can talk more. Cool. Yeah. I yeah, totally. So at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, we're hosting an after party for this talk on Clubhouse and the link's in the chat right now. If you join us, you'll be able to submit some more questions and hear uh, us and some other friends from the startup industry talk about other contrarian tips. But I think the, the biggest idea here is just that like starting by being more ambitious, which seems like it might make everything so much harder, actually unlocks so many opportunities because it's often the, the greenfield space where other people haven't already picked it over uh, and where the, the sort of moat of actually of the difficulty creates this open space for you. So I hope that you guys can take a bunch from this uh, this talk and, and bring it into your own startup to build something new that's different than everything else and actually reduces complexity rather than just adding to complexity. So if you want to hear more about this idea, join us on Clubhouse at 5.30 p.m. Pacific or uh, join my Substack at constein.substack.com and I'm going to be writing a whole article about Parker's theory here. Uh, but yeah, Parker, uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, Rippling, incredible HR plus IT company. If you guys are looking for ways to you know, reduce your headaches and what happens when you hire an employee or have to offboard them uh, or just want to deal with like your payroll and where your IT equipment is going. Rippling is, does an incredible job and they're just on an absolute tear. So congratulations on all your success so far, Parker. And thank you for joining us with this incredible presentation. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Startup Grind. And thanks to everybody out here there. Bye.